for Ingmar and his talk, Stages of the Spiritual Path in the Voice of Science. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, the title. It is recording, yes, yes. But the, actually, the title is not the stages of the spiritual, but the structure. Uh, it comes more or less uh, down to the same thing. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's wrong. <laughs> It will not be as long as the earlier talk, so I've been warning for that. Yeah. Introduction. In terms of Tibetan, this literary genre, uh, the voice of the silence can be characterized as a stage of the past work. I we said it in the earlier talk also. In each of its three fragments, uh, discussing a different stage or moment of the spiritual path. It could be interesting to see how the themes match known divisions of the Buddhist path, especially in perspective of determining the origin of the text of the voice and the secret books of QT, from which the three fragments of the voice are thought to have been taken. Although there are many Buddhist elements in fragment one, for our analysis, they may be not significant because most of it is Hinduism and all kinds of other things. Because the terminology of fragment one is mainly Hinduism, we will not include it. We will focus on fragments two and three. The result of our analysis would be a model into which the elements of fragment one may be fitted. The analysis divided into two sections about fragments two and three, followed by a synthesis of all three fragments. The parts of fragments two, and we have again the picture of Joseph Atkins. The heart and eye doctrines, what are they? The heart doctrine and eye doctrine in fragment two are in note two one, identified as the Kyao men and Tsum men, the exoteric and esoteric schools of Chinese Buddhism, as they are found in Atkins' work, Chinese Buddhism. For example, on page 158, he writes, Bodhidharma brought from the Western heaven the seal of truth, the true seal and opened the fountain of contemplation in the East. He pointed directly to Buddha's heart and nature, swept away the parasitic and alien growth of book instruction, and thus established the Tsumen, or esoteric branch of the system containing, containing the tradition of the heart of the Buddha. In chapter seven of Atkins' work, we find a report on the schools of Chinese Buddhism, among which are the Kyao men and the Tung men. The esoteric schools are summarized in the following table. Now the table is, is quite uh, extensive, of course. And most of the schools in this table, which comes from the work of Atkins, uh, they don't exist anymore. But we can see from the existing schools, we can see something where this is going, where Blavatsky is pointing us with uh, this word Tsumen. It may be noted that of these seven, seven Tsumen schools, only two lineage are still ex in existence. The Japanese Rinzai and its Ask offshoot Obaku and the Soto school are well-known schools of Zen philosophy and practice. So they are particularly <clears throat> Zen schools. And of course, we know that Blavatsky identified the word Zhang and the word Zhang with Zen also. Mm -hmm. So that may be interesting for us to see. Uh, so it's, it's experiential. Moreover, Sutil and Hodas in their dictionary called the Chan and Zen school the intuitive sect of Bodhidharma the sect of the Buddha heart. 
This school is holding that each individual has direct access to, to the Buddha through meditation, as opposed to the Kyaoman tradition of studying the words of the Buddha. On the subject of the doctrine of the eye and the doctrine of the heart or the heart seal, HPB has written an article which was part of the material published by Annie Besant as volume three of the secret doctrine and later published in collected writings. In this article, she states, but it is only in the trans Himalayan fastnesses, loosely called Tibet, in the most inaccessible spots of desert and mountain that the esoteric good law, the heart seal lives to the present day in all its pristine purity. We can see this as an indication that the reason for using Chinese terms like Qiangmen and Tsungmen is not that we would be able to find these pristinely pure schools in the Far East. Further on, the heart seal, she writes in the Tisovko glossary and the swastika, its symbol was stamped on the Buddha's heart and therefore called the heart seal. You can see that in the uh, Japanese Buddha here, was indeed a swastika on his heart. So that is apparently the symbol for esoteric or inward knowledge, knowledge which is, doesn't come from books, but from a direct experience. It seems the entry was at least partly based on Atkins' description on page 63 of his book. In Suthill and Hoga's later dictionary, we find similar elements of information under Fu, uh, Fu Yi, and uh, Fu Xin Yi. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying my best on the Chinese. I, I, I check my Chinese against the, the Chinese person, so uh, it should be somewhere. The Buddha Mutta. The seal of the Buddhist heart or mind, the stamp, the universal heart, the stamp of the universal Buddha heart in everyone. The seal on a Buddha's heart or breast, the swastika. And in collective writings, the heart seal is called sin yin. And you will find the word sin yin everywhere in the secret doctrine also. So this is what it is apparently. The secret and open ways, what are they? Also in Atkins, we find for this classification, the native terms in use are yen and mi, or yen and mi. <laughs> the open and secret ways are also the exoteric and esoteric approach to Buddhism, which is in fact the same. So we, have, we are talking about the same things here. The open and secret is exactly the same as the uh, uh, the the eye and the heart doctrine. The Pratyeka and Bodhisattva paths, what are they? The author of the voice interprets these two also as Hinayana and Mahayana Buddhism, respectively. For example, on page 41 to 43 of the voice, we can see that the open way is interpreted in this fragment as the Pratyeka path and the secret way as the Bodhisattva path. The end goal of the secret way is this Samyak Sambuddha, the teacher of perfection. Thus, the first path is liberation, but the second path is renunciation. The open way, no sooner has thou reached its goal, will lead thee to reject the bodhisattvic body. The secret way leads also to paranirvanic bliss, but at the close of kalpas without number. But it is said, the last shall be the greatest, Samyak Sambuddha, the teacher of perfection, gave up his self for the salvation of the world by stopping at the threshold of Nirvana, the 
pure state. So here we see that the structure of the pass is very straightforward. The eye doctrine and heart doctrine are the same as the exoteric and esoteric uh, paths. The open paths and the secret paths are the same. And uh, Prajeka and Bodhisattva paths are also exactly the same. So no problems so far. And then we get in fragment three, the paths of John and Paramita. What are they? In the beginning of fragment three, the candidate is addressed as Shabaka, which means hearer, of course, uh, listener or auditor. And then there is a choice to be made between the paths of John and Paramita. Wilt thou choose, O thou of doubtless, doubtless heart, the Samtan, that's the Tibetan word for um, Dhyan, of eye doctrine, fourfold dhyana, or thread thy way through the paramitas, six in number, noble gates of virtue leading to bodhi and to prasana, the seventh step of wisdom. At this point, two different paths begin, the fourfold path of dhyana or dhyana, and the seventh pole, fold path of paramita. These two paths are said to be suitable for two different kinds of uh, pilgrims. In note 36, is it, said, it is said that in each of the four stages of jhana, the candidate has a fixed number of rebirths left, the arhat awaiting no more rebirths, which is the last stage of the four. The still steeper path might therefore refer to, besides the Paramita path, perhaps to the faster Tantric path, on which it is said that, that it is a path to liberation within the candidate's present lifetime. And I found this, these great, great um, images with that. So the, the left one is the, the path of Dhyana, which is uh, winding. But uh, when I read it, I think it is winding along a mountain, uh, on the outside of a mountain. That means that it's, it can be less steep. And the steep path is uh, on the right, <laughs> <laughs> which is the path of Pandit. Further in note 323, we find Sovani is one who practices Sovan, the first part of Dhyana, the Shrota Pati. Thus, the first pass of the fourth world pass of Dhyana is the stage of Shrota Pati. And from note 36, we may derive that the other three stages of this pass are Sakridagami, Anagami, and Arhat. So now we know exactly these are the four stages of the path of John. Thus, the first path in first path. Oh. Moreover, so on is a single term for Srotapati. This fourfold path is known as the Arya or noble path or Arya Maga in Pali Buddhism. The Arya path is mentioned twice toward the end of fragment three. It is the path of the Buddhas of perfection. A Buddha of perfect perfection is what is called a Samyak Sambuddha, who is literally completely wide awake. So that is the largest expansion possible of our consciousness. Before the end of the Arya path, the candidate may choose to become a Bodhisattva after crossing the stream. Uh, crossing the stream is a motif where uh, the word paramita uh, refers to. It's gone over something or gone beyond means paramita. And we have heard also from Eugene that uh, the waters of Akshara are uh, the waters that should be, should be crossed, crossing the stream. About ending of the path of Jan, we find in note 334, Bodhisattvas who, having reached the rank of Arhat, that is, having completed the fourth or seventh path, 
So that means the end of uh, the path, uh, uh, each, each of the fourth and the seventh path ends in the state of Arhat. And you can see that in the diagram here. Yeah. As the beginnings of the fourth fold and seventh fold paths are apparently at the same point as they both lead to Arhatship, the following diagram would be a possible representation of the two paths in one, that is the, uh, the Y figure. So apparently after the Shrabaka stage, the path uh, splits into two. In the form of a table with the names and the Shrabaka stage added, and using the original spelling of the main text, the two paths in one look something like the table on the right. So there's no correspondence between the left and the right side. And you see the paramitas as stages in the uh, paramita path. And on the left, you see the four stages of the dhyana path. So what does that mean? What, what do the terms mean? Shrota Pati is someone who uh, is an auditor. Shru is to hear. Uh, like in the Greek mysteries also in the Vatican. Sakra Dagami or Sakri Dagami is a person who has gone into the stream. The Anagami is one is, is a person who only has one incarnation left. So that is a stage where uh, everything which can be learned in an incarnation is uh, in the present incarnation. And the Arhat, he does not have to learn anymore. So that's the end of the development. As in the diagram, the divisions of this table and each of the two pathways are not related horizontally. Contradiction and solution. Now we get into the problems. We have seen that in fragment two, the Pratyeka path and the Bodhisattva path are directly connected to the two other divisions, the open and secret way, the eye and the heart doctrine respectively. In other words, we have a simple Y structure or parallel structure. If we look again at the choice given in fragments three, you can look it up, up if you want. That's the first, no, it's not the first line, the third line of uh, on page 45. Will thou choose the sum tongue of I doctrine? fourfold dhyana or thread thy way through paramitas. And then when you go back to the beginning of fragment three, you see Upadya, the choice is made. I thirst for wisdom. Now hast thou rent the veil before the secret path and taught the great Ayana. Thy servant is ready for thy guidance. So the first sentence of fragment two is uh, which will, uh, is the choice is made. And the third sentence is what will thou choose? Which will thou choose? So that is strange. That is, uh, that was bothering me when I read, first read it. But when you first read things, you think that, uh, the problem is with you and not with the text, <laughs> which is good, by the way. But um, I've been puzzling and puzzling over this. And um, I couldn't get any real solution. So if anyone uh, thinks he has a better solution, I'm available for any comment. But I, I could not, uh, I could not uh, make uh, these, thing, these, two, these two things agree. So there's a choice between the greater yana, the Mahayana and the Inayana, so the Pratyeka and the Bodhisattva uh, way. And if they are equal uh, to the Dhyana and the Paramita path, then we have a problem here. So, so the structure would be something like this, which is not really sensible. <laughs> That's, that's clear for everyone, huh? yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
we cannot think otherwise than that some of the stanzas in the beginning of fragment three must have been misplaced. Now, this is, of course, a very bold statement, but uh, I'm just, as a proposition, telling it to you. Perhaps you can see for yourself if you agree with this. Another option which should always be taken to it, into account in HPP's writings and in the esoteric literature in general is that of deliberate errors. It seems that there is no reason for that in this case. So it's as it is only the structure of the past which is spoken of and no big secrets. Now, at first sight, we have two possibilities. The first stanza was misplaced or the third and following. If the third and following are replaced, for example, that it should have been placed at the beginning of fragment two, this means that there is no second choice to be made in fragment three. In that case, fragment three is only about the Bodhisattva path, the most important element of which is the seven parameters. This seems to be the only plausible option which also corresponds to the titles of fragment one, uh, two, and three. If the first stanza was misplaced, we would enter two new contradictions. You can uh, explore that for yourself. So taking into account that these few verses, uh, first three, four, and five, uh, are perhaps misplaced and should be placed in uh, section two, fragment two. The structure would be, again, very simple. So um, the I doctrine and the heart doctrine correspond to the Jan and Paramita paths. And we have a completely parallel structure. And I thought at first, of course, this is too simple. But I came across um, some different um, scholarly views which confirmed this actually. One of them is Joseph Atkins' Chinese Buddhism, and the other is in Schlag Ins White's uh, book, Buddhism in Tibet. And for, for everyone who knows that book, that is one, uh, the book where she gets the most information on Tibetan Buddhism. Um, the brothers Schlag Ins White were very, uh, they were one of the first who were doing field research in the environment of, of Tibet, mainly in Nepal. And uh, they were suffering from cold very much in the winter, but they <laughs> stayed all year round and they investigated Buddhism. Very interesting stories in itself. But the book is, of course, you, you have to place the book in the context of the time. It was written in 1883, and they thought that Everything which, which was mystical was exactly the same as the esoteric or secret or the Bodhisattva past. They thought the Bodhisattva past was mystical and the Pratyeka past was not, not mystical, which is in practice or in modern views completely uh, different. In the scholarly works HPB consulted, for instance, Emil Schlagin's Weiss, Buddhism in Tibet, and Joseph Atkins. Chinese Buddhism, Hinayana was invariably seen as exo exoteric and Mahayana as esoteric, contemplative and mystical. Studying different works by HPB, we come across these terms quite often. For HPB, esoteric meant concealed. On page 13 of the key, she mentions, she identifies theosophy with the Gupta Vitya which she translates correctly as concealed knowledge, which is, of course, identical to the secret path in fragment two of the voice. Now, we know, of course, that the Bodhisattva path is not a secret path only because the Dalai Lama is uh, speaking about it uh, quite often. So that's not, uh, that's not according to reality. Interestingly, in the same passage, she connects the Buddhist lesser and greater vehicles to the lesser public and greater secret Greek mysteries. A different way of viewing the past. A 
a different way of viewing these paths is to thinking of them is thinking of them as stages for one larger path or the one including the other. So if we say lesser and greater uh, schools, then they encompass each other. In Mahayana Buddhist works of the third turning of the Buddha of Dharma, we often find this way of looking at the path, which is called Ekayana. And Ekayana is typically for the third turn and is a philosophy where all the paths uh, are connected together. And that is one of the uh, hallmarks also of the voice. The one vehicle or single path, which is in fact the two paths in one. The complete Mahayana Buddhist path to enlightenment is sometimes divided into three uh, divisions, Shravakayana, Pratyekayana, and Bodhisattvayana, which three paths, which is three paths in one, they include each other. Of course, this, is not, this, this view is not shared by the Shravakayanists because they think they have a whole path, but uh, the Bodhisattvayanists who have the the end of the uh, development, they think the Shabakayanis are part of their, their part. From a historical point of view, the path of Jan, the Arya path, already existed in Theravada or Hinayana Buddhism, while the six paramitas typically, typically are a later development of early Mahayana, Bodhisattva Yana Buddhism. In a historical sense, and therefore also a philosophical sense, they are not parallel but consecutive and encompassing, encompassing each other. Vajrayana may be seen as an even later stage of development, encompassing, encompassing or being encompassed by Bodhisattva Yana. The three fragments, the structure of the three fragments, the first fragment, entitled The Voice of the Silence, end with Om Tatsat. This mantra is found in the Bhagavad Gita, where Lord Krishna explains that this mantra is the eternal sound, synonym to the absolute. The second fragment, the two paths, ends with Om Vajrapani Hum, the mantra of Vajrapani, the boulder of the thunderbolt, the wrathful aspect of Avalokiteshvara. Ruffle picture of him. <laughs> it's this kind. Uh, from the fact that Vajrapani is a Russell deity, we may derive that in fragment two we are talking about the secret path, which is perhaps kept secret because its values may go beyond the socially accepted or even are opposite of what is generally seen as acceptable. Now we have thought quite a quite a lot about morals and ethics of the secret of the voice. And the Bodhisattva Yana has uh, generally is seen as um, this um, compassionate uh, type of um, type of uh, direction in Buddhism. But we see here Vajrapani, well, he is not he is not the compassionate kind of uh, god, of course. So uh, so it's interesting to, to think about this. So what, what kind of ethics would, it, would there be if there was also a choice, not only for Bodhisattva Yana, but also for Vajrayana, because there's a completely different ethics, which can go into, you can go uh, against uh, social norms that we know. The third fragment, the seven portals, ends with peace to all beings, which is a general formula for ending every treatise invocation or instruction, as HPB explains in note 37 to fragment three. If we try to unite these fragments, maybe at a dead end because they are different in function. In that respect, they are really three different fragments of one text or narrative. The first fragment is mainly about Hinduism and yoga, but also about Hinayana, together representing the Shravaka or Pratyeka Buddha path. The second fragment, however, is not about the path, but about the choice. 
between two paths, the open path and the secret path, introducing the motivation for the Bodhisattva path. The third fragment is mainly about the seven Paramitas, the virtues. I'm going fast and fast. Uh, the third fragment is mainly about the seven paramitas, virtues in which the bodhisattva ideal is presupposed, and the first and most important paramita being dana, the key of charity and love immortal. In similar context, dana is often translated as giving, of course, not only in the sense of giving other people material things, but more importantly, leading a life with the attitude of giving. Without this virtue, the motivation for becoming a bodhisattva would be absent. In that case, the person would be more suitable to the open path. The Lamrin Chen Mo. Here we have a picture of the author of the book of Lamrin, where uh, HPP talks about in her article, The Secret Books of Lamrin and John, uh, Lama Tsongkhapa. And this is a modern edition of the Book of Lamrin, which could be interesting for us uh, studying the report. Um, in her article entitled The Secret Books of Lamrin and Jan, surprisingly, HPB does not actually mention the Book of Lamrin, but this work of Pylon Tsongkhapa is a well-known example of the stages of the past genre. Its full title is Lamrin Chenmo, the great work about the stages of the path. Its Bodhisattva section is devoted to the Paramitas, which is good study material for those who are serious in following the path set forth in fragment three of the words. Another well-known chapter of Lamrin is the three types of persons. About the question we have encountered in fragment two, the choice between the two paths, two paths. Tsongkhapa distinguishes three types of character, each more suitable for the bodhisattva path than the other. The lesser type, known to be the least, those persons who diligently strive to attain solely the choice of cyclic existence by any means for their welfare alone. The medium type, those persons are called medium, who stop sinful actions, turn their backs on the joys of cyclic existence, and diligently strive just for their own peace. So this is the Pratyeka type. Third type is called superior, who sincerely want to extinguish all the suffering of others by understanding their own suffering. So that is an example from which you can see that this book of Lamrim can be very interesting for us to study. And I'll skip the modern views and skip to the conclusions. Um, All different paths mentioned in fragments two and three of the voice are examined. The structure of the spiritual path in fragments two and three is simple. After the Shravaka path, there is a choice between two different paths of development, the exoteric and the esoteric paths. The path which is called exoteric is known as the fourth or Arya path with the stages Sakridagami, Anagami and Arhat. The path which is called esoteric comprises the seven gates of developing the paramitas. This path leads to the same end state, that of Arhat, but is aimed at becoming a bodhisattva and relinquishing nirvana, the state of dissolution. Fragment one describes the path according to Hinduism and its yoga. The structure seems more complicated because a small series of verses near the beginning of fragment three 
are most probably misplaced, actually belong to fragment two. That's the conclusion. <laughs> so the, the most inspiring parts I have skipped over this, but thank you. Okay. This was our last lecture, and we are open for comments and questions. Perhaps you can uh, feel that this is not a completely finished story for me. And so yeah. I've been uh, looking and exploring, and I do not have a definitive conclusion. Is there anyone? Uh, Any question? Yeah, please. Not, not, not 